Hello, Don McCray here with Premier Police Training. And I put together a presentation on thoughts and discussion concerning the George Floyd Minneapolis Police Department incident that occurred uh, recently. And I do want to extend my sincere condolences to the family of Mr. Floyd. Folks, I'm very sorry for your loss. Very sorry. And then I, I really want to make sure that I, I, I talk to law enforcement and we need to start really looking at our profession and, and what we do, how we do it, and how we train to do it. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. We need to visit about four case laws. So let's begin with these three. Graham versus Connor, 1989. When we're done there, we'll move to Lytle v. Bexar County, uh, 2009, and from there we'll then discuss Abraham v. Rosso, 1999. I'm assuming that some of you have heard of Graham v. Connor. I'm not so sure how many are familiar with Lytle or Abraham, so I'm pretty sure all three of these case laws are going to surface in this uh, case. Graham v. Connor. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1989 changed the judicial standard and process for evaluating whether or not a law enforcement officer's application of force was justified. And what came out of that court case were two things, objective reasonableness or the reasonable officer standard, which there are six elements the courts use to review an officer's event to determine reasonableness. That works hand in hand with the other thing that came out of Graham v. Connor for officers to guide them in their report writing. The Graham factors of which there are now three and they work hand in hand. The officer uses uh, the Graham factors as his guide to properly articulate his report. That then goes into the six elements of objective reasonableness and what should be a fair system, an equitable system, the court then can better determine whether or not the officer's application of force was objectively reasonable. Well, let's just hit the officer side of things, the three Graham factors. The court wants the officer to answer the question, what was the nature or severity of the crime you were dealing with? They also want to know Officer, describe for us how the suspect actively resisted you. And then we also want you to tell us and describe for us how the suspect's actions posed an immediate threat to you or someone else. Because they're going to start their evaluation of an officer's use of force incident at the moment force is applied under the totality of the circumstances. Okay, the Graham factors. Let's move over to Lytle v. Bexar County. When an officer is initially justified in using force, he may not continue to use such force after it has become evident that the threat justifying the force has vanished. You got to stop. When that, when that resistance ends, you need to stop your application of force. All right. Well, let's see what Abraham V. Rosso says. Force justified at the beginning of an encounter is not justified even seconds later if the justification for the initial force has been eliminated. What we're going to do then is we're going to look at this application of force that occurred in the George Floyd incident and we're going to evaluate it and we're going to start that evaluation at the moment force was applied and we'll look at it under the totality of the circumstances. We know from the information provided that there were four officers on scene. George Floyd was laying handcuffed with his arms behind his back on his stomach in the street. Three of those officers are on top of Mr. Floyd and George is stating that he can't breathe. And as you can see from the photo, there is an officer that is taking his left knee and his body weight and is, and is compressing his neck. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate using the Graham factors what happened. 
and we're going to do so at the moment the officer was applying force in the form of his knee and body weight pressing down onto the neck of Mr. Floyd who was on a hard surface with his hands handcuffed behind his back telling the officer he can't breathe. So officer at the moment you were doing this uh, what was the nature of the severity of the crime that you were dealing with here? It was forgery. Okay officer next question at the moment you were applying this force and he's telling you he can't breathe how was Mr. Floyd actively resisting you? He wasn't. An officer, final question. At the moment you continued to apply this force downward onto the neck of Mr. Floyd, who's telling you he can't breathe, were his actions posing an immediate threat to you at that time? Or to another? No, they didn't. We have to come to the conclusion that the officer's actions failed the gram factors. Well, what about the other three officers? They didn't have their knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, so why were they fired and why are they in trouble too? Well, here's a test for everyone watching this. Um, I'm assuming with the importance of this case now, Kent v. Oakland County 2016, that every officer must know you know it, correct, if you're listening to this and you're an officer. And if not, it's probably because you've been failed. Somehow your training that's supposed to be provided by your agency isn't somehow keeping up. Because this case has huge civil ramifications for law enforcement. And here's why. Here's why you needed to know it. An officer on scene who had the opportunity to intervene in an unreasonable application of force by another officer but failed to act can be denied qualified immunity. In other words, you can't just stand by. You have a duty to intervene. What we have then is a human life and four careers gone, just like that. Why? I'll give you three reasons, most likely. First reason, lack of training. I see it all the time. It's almost as though law enforcement agencies in this country, do they, I don't know, they, they can't see it. They can't see that they're really not training properly. And all I have to do is, when, when I get hired, I come in and I start off with assessments. It tells me right away the, the state of affairs of their training program. Well, the second reason, it's lack of training. And the third reason, that's lack of training. And my guess also is if I were to provide those officers involved my basic use of force knowledge assessment, they'd probably fail it. And the reason is many agencies still don't provide adequate tr uh, training in use of force. And quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of other areas, particularly the Fourth Amendment, Search and seizure, Terry stops, arrests, right? Not just application of force. What it is time for is it's time for agencies to start prioritizing training. This incident was totally preventable, 100% preventable. If you have time, please go to Premier Police Training's YouTube channel and take a look at our latest videos exposing the problems with law enforcement training and the incredible need for non-escalation training. And the link can be found below this video. These incidents must stop. They, they must. And providing the right kind of use of force training and making it a priority is more important now than ever. I'm going to sign off now. This is Dominic Ray with Premier Police Training. I do want to just encourage my brothers and sisters out there uh, doing a difficult job. Hang in there. Um, be safe. Do the right thing. And 
put that pressure on your agencies to, to really start giving you the, the right kind of training that's going to help you be more successful in uh, this tough environment in which we work. Thank you.